Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Maggie Forbes. I'm the executive director. I can't say here at the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall, uh, but that's that's where I am. And I am very excited to welcome you to our second Saturday Civil War series via Facebook and Zoom. Uh, it's uh, I was I was just remembering uh, that we had this wonderful series uh, program scheduled on March 14th and on Friday night the 13th I informed Diane Kleinfelter that we couldn't do it because we had been ordered to close the building um, as a library um, a library and music hall um, and I really can't wait to welcome you all back to our historic landmark facility when we are allowed to gather again to our historic landmark facility that is home to the Captain Thomas Espy Post of the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, I have sort of heightened emotions uh, today, uh, first and foremost, uh, because of the program. I've heard Kenneth Surface speak before, and I know we have a terrific program in front of us. And I think many of you know um, that Diane Kleinfelter has retired as Espy Post curator. Uh, but this is the first time that I'm giving voice to it verbally at an official occasion. And it, it does give me a little bit of pause. Um, Diane has served in, as SB Post Curator since 2006 and has stewarded this, the Captain Thomas SB Post uh, since then through its meticulous historic restoration, but even more importantly, developing the programs and the relationships that have helped position the SB Post as the national treasure that it really is. Diane promises me that she will stay involved with the SB Post as a volunteer. And I promise everybody here that at some point when we can gather, we will do this more officially to thank Diane for her extraordinary impact on the Captain Thomas SB Post. Um, part of it, as I mentioned, relationships. Uh, this transition to welcoming John Eric Gillot as our SB Post curator is as smooth and positive as it could possibly be. Um, John Eric worked as an intern um, in the SB Post. I've known him since then, not as well as Diane has, um, from 2009 to 2011, is that right? Uh, thereabouts, while he was earning his master's degree in library science from Kent State. Um, he, we know him, but more to the point, John Eric knows the Captain Thomas Espy Post and he's here, he's accepted this position um, because of his feelings about the post and, and how, what an important historic treasure it is. Um, I'm not one to rattle off people's credentials, but he has many of them. He serves on the board of Emerging Civil War. He's widely published about the Civil War I am really looking forward to the upcoming book he's co-authored on uh, Harper's Ferry, something I know way too little about, but I'll, I'll wait and read your book, John Eric, and we'll have some wonderful program about that. Um, but I just wanna say, I cannot imagine, you know, I am so aware of all that Diane has done and Diane and I are in complete accord in just really looking forward to where John Eric takes it from here. And that's really all I have to say, John Eric, it's your program. Well, thank you, Maggie. And thank you, Diane. Thank you for the vote of confidence. Um, very happy to be back at the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall and the Captain Thomas Espy Post. Um, so we'll get the ball rolling here today with just a few announcements at first. As you know, the library reopened on February 1st and last Saturday, the Captain Thomas Espy Post reopened for tours. So for all of you itching to get out of the house, um, like I am after a full year of quarantine, um, the, tour, the post is open for tours with our docents every Saturday from uh, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. So please feel free to come out for a tour. Um, you, we are socially distancing and masks are required. We have hand sanitizer available. So it's... Uh, it's a really wonderful experience. I was there last weekend and we look forward to welcoming everyone back. Um, if any of our viewers in the Pittsburgh area have children or grandchildren who might be interested, our friends at the Soldiers and Sailors Hall in Oakland 
are having a Civil War history and reading camp this August. Uh, it's for grades five through eight. And you can find more information on their website, uh, which is soldiersandsailorshall.org. Our speaker next month is going to be Meg Growling, a historian with Emerging Civil War. She'll discuss uh, antebellum militias and how these organizations would provide the, the structure and the backbone for the Union and Confederate armies in the early days of the Civil War. Um, actually, later this year, Meg will uh, publish a biography on Elmer Ellsworth, who you know, Civil War buffs and historians know was a famous militia drill master before the Civil War and uh, was one of the very first casualties of the war. Uh, as many of you who know the Captain Thomas S.P. Post know, the S.P. Post included many veterans of the uh, St. Clair Guards, which was a local pre-war militia company. Um, we have their flag in our collection, the drum, and several other pieces from the, uh, from the St. Clair Guards. So it's a very relevant topic for us. Uh, and Meg will actually be speaking one month from today. Uh, that's March 13th at 1 p.m. Following month, we'll have Mark Malloy, who's a historian with uh, Emerging Revolutionary War. And he'll talk to us, uh, talk with us about the Battle of Fort Sumter and the first shots of the Civil War. Mark is a historian with the National Park Service, and he is a former park ranger at Fort Sumter. And he'll join us on April 10th. Uh, we'll likely continue with these Zooms. We, we have them scheduled actually through June and then uh, you know, we'll take our summer break, but we are hopeful to uh, be able to reconvene in person later this year. And like Maggie said, uh, celebrate Diane at that time. Um, but today we have Ken Surface, a good friend of the Captain Thomas SB Post. Uh, he'll be, he's here to discuss uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Civil War Railroads. Ken has uh, appeared publicly as General Grant since 2009. Uh, he's performed in History Channel's Lee and Grant production in 2010 and uh, in the HBO series Family Tree in 2013. Currently, he speaks at events across the country and portrays Grant in the Gettysburg Remembrance Day parades. Uh, if you have seen Ken, you know he is General Grant. Um, so for those on Zoom, uh, feel free to use the chat function to ask any questions as we go along. Uh, we'll also be following along on Facebook. Uh, and we can answer any questions there as well. So General Grant, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. And uh, welcome, everybody. I appreciate your, uh, your time today. And I'm fully aware that we may be, are we under a certain amount of time? We have about an hour, is it? So folks have to come and go. Sure. Yeah. Uh, About I, an hour. Well, as always, I have more information than time is allotted for. So if there are questions that come, I'm happy to indulge those questions. I don't want to turn this into a reading uh, lecture along the way. So I'm sure if there are railroad buffs that are out here to talk and there are other people with Civil War information, maybe even local Civil War history that uh, enhances the program, I welcome that because it is a bit of uh, information sharing. People, people have appreciated trains since uh, trains have, have come along. And particularly what I find interesting is the people who live farther away from the track appreciate them much more than the people who live along the track. Um, <laughs> that seems to have been the story from the start. Uh, even before the war began, the railroads were already building this nation into uh, what you can call maybe a great power. We're definitely on the way in the 1850s for that. And I'm sure we're in your area in Carnegie that is extremely important to uh, the industry there. So freight and passenger trains are already running, the same that uh, freight and passenger wagons had been running, as you can see from this uh, courier and I print here. And if I can get to it to show you a larger uh, image, oh, there you are. You can see this is what we're, what we're seeing in the start of the Civil War time, as far as our, our trains. Now, railroads are dominating much of the thoughts of many across the country, except in a military environment, which I find rather interesting that uh, the military is not considering the advantages of trains. Now, I'm having a bit of a technology hiccup here because I'm trying to get to where I can uh, get back to manipulating the image. There we are. All right. Before steam locomotives were running, trains were pulled by horses. You know, we have, you have horse and wagons, the famous Conestoga wagon trail 
from Eastern Pennsylvania goes through and uh, somebody gets the idea to uh, put wagons in tandem behind teams of horses and it quickly realizes that pulling more than two wagons is not an ideal without some sort of system that keeps the wagons together. So the wagons are put onto rails. Uh, already in England though, uh, by the 1830s, the English have developed steam locomotives first and developed different, uh, pioneered different uh, track systems for that. And we'll get into some of the uh, difference in gauge and the inspirations for the track, the track sizes that we use, <coughs> excuse me, at the start of the war. Now, throughout the course of the war, and even, uh, even a few years before, it's pretty commonplace to find soldiers and supplies and food transported by rail, as well as civilian passengers and freight. Uh, the advantage with a steam-powered train over a horse-drawn is that it can go farther and faster and uh, in a greater volume than, than an animal-pulled uh, train. So it does, it does challenge the industrial system. It actually inspires the industrial system to grow. And it does so with the military. Uh, something to consider with Washington's army at Yorktown uh, was, was, was extremely small considering what you would even just take one portion of the entire federal army. Now, granted, we have a million men in uniform when, when Lee surrenders, but uh, just considering the Army of the Potomac or the Army of the Tennessee, our various field armies that are named for the rivers where near they operate, they're, they're hailing around 90,000, 100,000 men at any given point. Then that is probably five or six, maybe 10 times as much as anything Washington could have ever conceived in the field. So larger armies demand a greater supply system and greater supply systems or, or greater ability for supply systems inspire and demand a growth in the technology. So the two kind of grow up together. And you may, uh, you may find that uh, an interesting thing. Now, politicians and businessmen, it becomes uh, pretty quickly that the railroads are gonna make, the, make or break the efforts of the Union Army to uh, just get from one place to another, let alone how they're going to fight. And the railroads quickly quickly become a strategic point to those of us who can recognize that and are willing to adapt. The Southerners as well as the Northerners understand this. And the Southerners, in uh, fact, one of the, one of the things that causes the, uh, se se the secession to actually come is that the Southern states are arguing that they want greater, uh, they want more federal money to to develop ports and rail facilities, and uh, you know, how we hopefully expand the economy. Most of the railroad development is in the North. At the start of the war. There is about uh, 27,000 miles of track across all of the United States. Two thirds of that is in the north. So it's about 9,000 miles of track is in the southern states below the Mason-Dixon line. And the majority of the track in the southern states is uh, mixed gauges throughout. Uh, most railroads are named for the end point and the, the starting point of their lines, such as uh, the Hanover and Gettysburg Railroad in Pennsylvania, uh, you have the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which is our largest railroad during the war, and it spans from Baltimore to the Ohio River and out beyond Pittsburgh, as you're probably aware. So uh, in the South, the Western and Atlantic is a bold name to say that it's going from the Atlantic Ocean out into the Western portion of uh, the Southern states. Uh, the, the railroads I encounter through Tennessee and Mississippi, the Mobile and Ohio, the uh, Nashville and Chattanooga, or uh, rather the Nashville and Charleston line, things like that, they tell you the, uh, the, the two points in between. So the majority of the lines are only running maybe 80 or 90 miles at the most before they terminate. And the, the individual railroads don't see a need to connect on because their only concern is moving freight and people from their starting point to their end point, and you're on your own from there. Now, Lincoln uh, really understands this when he's campaigning and in 1860 in his plank, he boldly stated that he would he would like to see a transcontinental railroad develop and all in one gauge so he wouldn't have to change trains because that is something that happens as he comes into Washington City uh, for the inauguration. The train comes into Baltimore and there's a station stop. So he has to uh, either go by streetcar or walk a few blocks across Pratt Street to a different station to get on a different line that'll take him down to the Capitol. Now that's that's a, that's a hindrance for commerce. Businessmen traveling, families that are traveling have to make station stops with all their luggage, everything they own offloaded from one train to the next. Freight is the same sort of thing. If you're transporting goods, they have to be unloaded and that takes time to unload. It takes time to reload if the train is ready to receive them. 
And in a military standpoint, this becomes extremely uh, a hindrance to movement for the armies. And any any good logistics chief will tell you that's uh, that's going to slow things down. Military commanders' uh, most important asset besides the soldiers themselves is time, and the railroads represent a great uh, advantage in time if they can be applied to their uh, their strategies. Now, uh, what you'll have is varying gauges anywhere from three foot gauge to the standard gauge of 46 and one half inches to a five foot gauge. And trains don't run on the different size track as Stonewall Jackson found out. Uh, John Eric, you, you probably know about this from your Harpers Ferry experience, how Jackson had tried to capture the trains that were coming into Harpers Ferry. So over a number of weeks, he was ordering when the trains could arrive and depart and he winds up bottling into the Harpers Ferry region, about five or six full uh, trains of 30 cars each. He has the cars dismantled and the locomotives dismantled to be transported to the Eastern portion of Virginia. They're dragged over the mountaintops and not being familiar enough with the railroads, he doesn't appreciate that several of those lines are in varying gauges. So a three foot gauge engine is brought to maybe Norfolk and it, they try to put it on the track, which is five foot gauge. So now you have a problem that you can't even use that train. And that's something that Lincoln was perceiving as far as a, an, an idea for a, a smooth flow of commerce. And we military folks, uh, we're looking at that as another reason. Now, locomotives such as this one that's, that's uh, depicted here is what becomes the standard size locomotive for American railroads in, uh, in our period. It's referred to as an American by class. You notice the, uh, the sets of wheels on, underneath it. You have the little wheels underneath the... Uh, the stack and the, where the cow catcher is, and you have the larger wheels connected to the rods, which are called drive wheels. And this, this is called a, in railroad uh, terms, and believe me, working with teamsters with wagons, thank goodness I grew up around horses, so I know their vernacular. Railroad men have their own terms, and they refer to their locomotives as iron horses, which appeals to me as a horseman. But they refer to a locomotive like this as a 440. They don't, they don't, use, the, they don't use the zero, they say O. Oh. What that means is if you're looking at it from the right to the left behind the cow catcher are four what they call pilot wheels. And they always do it in pairs. You have two on each side, of course, but there'll be four under, this, under the stack. Those are the pilot wheels and you have the drive wheel. So four, four, oh. Uh, if locomotives have more wheels under the cab that aren't drive wheels, they're there for stability and uh, to support the weight of the firebox, which is right above those drive wheels on that locomotive. This is obviously a wood burner. You see the tender behind it. Uh, I learned early on not to refer to it as a coal car because uh, the engine men would look at me and say, well, a coal car is in the back hauling coal. This is the tender which tends to the engine. So that was a good way to quickly uh, remember that. And like Teamsters, railroad men appreciate when you speak their language because they won't, uh, they won't talk to you even if they know what you're talking about or if they understand what you're trying to say. So this is called a, uh, an American by its class. There are larger locomotives being developed. The B&O and the Pennsylvania Railroad are two of the, of the lines that are being more bold about it. What they've realized quickly is that the more drive wheels you have, the uh, more tonnage you can pull because you have more tractive effort on the locomotive itself. It's again to adding more horses to your team. Now I could go into a sidebar about my own experiments with uh, arranging horse teams in tandem during my time at uh, Sackett's Harbor between the, the war with uh, Mexico and my time when I got out of the army in 54. And that would be what, what a trainman called double heading where they have two locomotives on the front of a train. Whereas I had actually arranged for two teams and two wagons to be connected in tandem and with a long set of lines to do that. So it was a little bit of experimentation on my part for the same reason you get more tractive effort. So the BNO is developing what they're calling 10 wheelers this is a 460, this design here that you see. And what's the point of all that? Well, obviously more pulling power, but you notice how big those drive wheels are. What the railroad men tell me, the diameter of the drive wheels the in inches, like if these are, are say 50 inch drive wheels, every inch of diameter equates to another mile faster in speed. So a 50 inch diameter wheel can tell you that this locomotive might have a top speed of 50 miles per hour. Now, that seems incredulous in our time, but I tell you in 1839, when I was traveling the West Point, 
as a 17 year old and really unwilling to go. What I found most pleasant about the travel was the time that I rode a train between Lewistown and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I wrote to my cousin that the uh, conductor told us we went 17 miles an hour. And in 1839, I couldn't marvel going more than five miles an hour on a horse. But here we are going at least three times that with a train. And I said, who could imagine ever going any faster? So here we are in 1865. We have locomotives going 50, 50 or 60 miles per hour. There's a story about uh, an ammunition train that was going to Antietam, where the trainmen estimate that at certain times is this 12-car uh, train loaded with cannon shot and large cannonballs was going what they estimated at 60 miles an hour. So it's incredible to think about uh, how they can do that. Heavy freight locomotives have smaller wheels than passenger locomotives. And this might, you might want to equate to the size of a draft horse, say like a Belgian or a, a larger uh, Clydesdale type horse, rather than a sprinter like a thoroughbred or some sort of racehorse. Racehorses tend to have long legs because they can stretch out further and gain more ground. Hence then uh, locomotives have larger wheels so the rotation of the wheel gives them a further distance to rotate completely where smaller wheel uh, locomotives have more tractive effort and a smaller spin. So they're quickly learning, such as this engine here, uh, smaller, uh, smaller drive wheels and in larger numbers give you greater tractive effort, which means you can pull longer trains. This isn't something we're learning at West Point in the 1830s when I go there. Uh, there it's not something they're teaching there during the war. So commanders in the field that have locomotives and trains to rely on, this is something if you don't start to catch on to it, you uh, quickly begin to appreciate why it's taking so long for the trains to move your people and your, uh, your supplies anywhere. Now, I mentioned uh, something else about our trains that we have pilot wheels on the front of the locomotives. And uh, that is in a way to guide the locomotives into curves. And what the railroad men say, the more wheels on the front, the faster the locomotive can go, which means it can actually negotiate curves at a higher speed with more pilot wheels in the front. Curiously, the British locomotive development doesn't add pilot wheels because they build most of their railroads in as many tangents and as many straight paths as they can trying to avoid curves because of uh, having to slow down into them. But they don't build their locomotives with pilot wheels either. They build them strictly with drive wheels to get as much effort out of them. And on straight stretches, you can imagine they're going to get more speed. Now, if we thought of that as we're building our railroads, imagine how that would help us out in a military uh, way but as it works out, most American railroads are built along rivers. Now, one of the reasons you might imagine they do that is because in order to produce steam, you need a fire source and a water source. Now, if there isn't a water source available, such as a water tank, a water tower along the line, then you have creeks and rivers alongside the line where they can quickly pump water into the tender to uh, restore that into the boiler. Because as like a teapot on a stove, if you don't have have water going in there and you try to boil something, you're not gonna get very far. And with locomotives, you can actually have explosions for that. So our rivers tend, or rather our railroads tend to be built along rivers and creeks in order to uh, number one, have a close water source. It's very much wooded. And as, we're, as locomotives are burning wood, you have a fuel source nearby that you need. But another reason is that most water routes along rivers are uh, more of a gradual incline or decline. Most trains can't ride more than a, a 4% grade. And that's an increase in the elevation from one point of the track to another. And uh, you run into problems in the hilly country in Pennsylvania and in Virginia and in Tennessee. You can imagine the states along the Appalachian Mountains, how that's going to be a detriment unless you either double head your locomotives for more effort or you build routes that are going to uh, overcome the steep grades. So something to keep in mind there is here, here's uh, a locomotive over a, a train of two locomotives and cars overcoming this uh, rather large space. Now, I would imagine the two locomotives are on there more for the effort of, of an incline you're going to encounter rather than just for speed. It does take two very talented engine crews to coordinate that because both locomotives function on their own and you got one pulling and one pushing against the other and they've got to work together and get, get that train moving. Uh, the industry involved in the, uh, the uh, engineering capacity of the railroads is something that's quite remarkable. You know that West Point is a military school, of course, and one of the primary functions of the military school is to uh, produce officers trained in engineering concepts. 
So something else about West Point, though, that works against the Army is that the officers graduating are not required to stay in the service. So many of the railroads are gobbling up these newly trained engineers as they come out of the West Point Academy, and they're, they're applying the, their talents now to these growing railroads. The Pennsylvania Railroad is uh, very, very uh, adept at acquiring these folks. They had uh, built in 1854, they had overcome uh, the, uh, the crest of the Appalachian chain through Pennsylvania near a town called Altoona that was built specifically because the railroad had come through. And they developed this long curve over this massive gap, which is referred to as the horseshoe curve. Uh, work was started on it in 1853, and uh, it was completed in 1854 as a two track line, one for westbound trains and one for eastbound trains. And it is quite the shape of a grand horseshoe. And it's not simply that it's scenic and it curves along pretty mountainsides. Uh, the whole point of it was to overcome a gap of over 122 feet from where the line was coming from the east in Altoona to where it's heading towards the town of Creston on the western side of Altoona at a much higher elevation, which is more than that 2% grade that I told you about that the locomotives could go. This becomes a significant uh, thing to transport goods when the war comes. Obviously, it's it's a great uh, a, a, a great way to get commerce over that hump in Pennsylvania, whether it's uh, people or just industrial goods from the Pittsburgh region to the east and so on. But uh, for a military standpoint, all the things coming out of Pittsburgh from the Allegheny Arsenal and the mills producing artillery pieces and what have you, getting over that mountain is crucial to getting things to the state capital at Harrisburg in order then to transport it further south. And uh, this horseshoe curve, it will come back in again at the time of uh, the Battle of Antietam as part of this other story that I had mentioned here. So the Pennsylvania Railroad develops this thing. The B&O Railroad is developing larger locomotives and uh, both railroads are kind of competing against each other yet at the same time, they're competing to uh, improve the technology available to military commanders. As you can see with uh, locomotive design, uh, the larger wheels, the, the steaming capacity, and the uh, effort to get things moving further. Now, what I have to tell you about is uh, why the track sizes are what they are. And I don't know why the picture hasn't caught up yet, but I'll wait for it there. When I mentioned gauge of the track, gauge refers to the distance in inches between one rail to the other rail. Uh, the railroad men will caution us to not stand in the gauge, as they call it, if we're standing about, and I quickly learned that uh, as well, and uh, come to appreciate the whole point of staying out of the gauges, because sometimes the locomotives are very quiet. Uh, when, you know, they, uh, they move along, they're hissing and they're, they're oozing steam, but until they blow a whistle or ring a bell, they, they can come up on you pretty quickly, which is, uh, can, be, can be pretty scary if you're not careful. Now, gauge is what you see here with the track. And I mentioned that there was a three foot gauge all the way up to a five foot gauge. We have settled on something called standard gauge, which is 56 and one half inches. And uh, the reason for that is kind of curious. Now we can say it's the British. We can say it's the British to, to uh, be at uh, the bottom of this, but it's actually the Romans who we have to uh, talk to about this. As it turns out, Roman war chariots pulled by two horses side by side, the wheels of those chariots are 56 and one half inches away from each other. When the Romans came to England and used their chariots across the English countryside, they developed ruts in the roads. They actually then developed roads and ran over them so many times that you have grooves into the ground itself for the wagons to ride in that the horses are pulling. Now, if you ride outside of those with wheels that are wider, that's okay if you can get outside of both ruts, but you tend to have, a, you know, the horses are pulling you one way or another, one of your wheels is going into one of those ruts and one is being out, that's gonna put some stress on your wagon and on the axles. So most people tried to build their wagons into that standard of 56 and one half inches for their, uh, their wagons being pulled. When the first trains are developed by the British, they use wagons as the cars being pulled by the locomotives and the wagons are already at that diameter. So their rail cars are going to be at that same diameter. 
and uh, when rail when railroads are beginning to be developed here, it's British and Scottish engineers who come and do that here, and they apply the same standard of gauge for the wagons that have been and that have also migrated from Europe to uh, America, and you have that problem if you want to call it that. But uh, quickly, standard gauge becomes the standard for us. This is an extreme narrow gauge, as you can imagine, you can see there. Uh, one of the reasons you build a narrow gauge line is if you don't have the uh, money for a larger locomotive, if your, your finances don't secure that. And also you see how the ties are built all the way across. This could be expanded to become a standard gauge line. A curious thing, late in the war, uh, when Petersburg, Virginia is under siege, we have a rail line from my headquarters at City Point that was originally a five foot gauge railroad that the Hopewell and City Point line spanning eight miles from City Point west towards Petersburg. Uh, we had to change the gauge of that line to 56 and one half inches because the US Army railroads are running standard gauge locomotives. So then we get into Petersburg, Petersburg falls to us and Lee is heading west to his, uh, his surrender at Appomattox eventually. But the rail line between Petersburg and Appomattox was also five foot gauge. So as the army is pursuing Lee west towards Appomattox to finally bring him to ground, the railroad is being converted also. One regiment of Burnside's Corps dedicated themselves to converting the track. So they took one of the rails and moved it six inches over in order to allow our standard gauge trains to keep up with supplies at a larger point. Now, we didn't know that until 1865, how important that was going to be. So it was an ongoing development in the technology. And the need for military uh, trains is always based on uh, speed and efficiency of the operations. So you can imagine how important it is to have that track like that. Uh, are, there, are there any questions right now at all? I'd like to uh, pause for a moment and find out if there is. I don't want to lose anybody. I know I've kind of been yammering on for a little while. Uh, so far, we haven't had any on Facebook or on here. Um, OK. If anyone, if anyone would like to unmute and ask a question at this point, Feel free. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the, the gauges. If, if the gauge, uh, the standard gauge goes all the way back to England and right. even further to Rome, why did we have multiple gauges anyway in, in the US, especially in the South? They were, you said they were all very different still by the time of the war. Right. And I guess as a corollary, when did they all get standardized in the, in the North? Well, even at the start of the war, we still have uh, several railroads, uh, even in, and particularly in Pennsylvania, that are running narrow gauge that will link to a standard gauge line. Uh, the Lancaster, Oxford, and Southern Railroad is a narrow gauge line, and it links to the Pennsylvania Railroad in Oxford, uh, which is south of Lancaster itself. Uh, the uh, East Broadtop Railroad in Orbicinia is another coal line that runs narrow gauge that connects to the main line of the standard gauge Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, the biggest reason that you'll do that narrow gauge track is easier to build. It takes less material, the ties can be shorter and what have you. And the locomotives and equipment are built smaller, so they are more affordable too. So many of these uh, short lines as they're called, which is most of the railroads to the South, they will build to a narrower gauge in order to have their 12 mile line because they can afford to, where if they wanted to build 12 miles of standard gauge, they might not have the budget to do that. So that's the consideration. But as our armies have gone through the South, um, we've been tearing up track, obviously, in order to disrupt the rebels, and they've been tearing up our track too. But when the track is rebuilt, it's all being rebuilt to standard gauge so that the Army railroads can actually use that. And uh, I guess a side benefit of that means that at the end of the war, all that track is going to be of the standard gauge that Lincoln had actually addressed in his desire to travel cross country without having to change trains. So yeah. I think that would... Uh, Yes. Can I have a question? <clears throat> I understand the concept of gauge, uh, the distance between the rails. Was there a set right. standard then for the rail itself, the gauge? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a weight. Uh, locomotive rail or railroad rail is all designed on how much weight per how many feet of rail is going to be applied to that. There's also the shape of the rail. Uh, initially, when rail, when rail was put down for cars pulled by horses, it was very light rail because the wagons themselves are very light. Uh, there was track 
made that had grooves in it so the, the wheels would stay in it. And then uh, railroad wheels are developed with flanges. So you have the wheel itself and there's a flange on it that allows the, the uh, wheel to stay on the rail and the flange is on the inside of the rail on one side and like that on the other side so that the wheels won't pop off the track. Now, the danger there is if your train's going too fast and it's too light, there is an opportunity from uh, the force inserted on it that the force of the speed of it could actually cause the cars to lift off and the flanges won't do you any good because they'll pop off over the sides of the rail. So the rail then has to be made taller so that the flanges can, can ride on the inside of the rail and the wheel head rides on the flat top of the rail. So it's um, the rail itself, if you were to take a piece of rail and cut it and look down it like you were like looking at a loaf of bread after cutting it in half, the shape of the rail has uh, evolved into a balloon kind of shape to it. And uh, there's, there's a newer type being developed with an I, like a, a Roman numeral I or letter shape to it with a flatter space on top and with more support underneath, whereas the balloon rail, it's flat on the top, but it curves away quickly. So it doesn't support as, as much weight. So the rail development is coming more into the shape of an eye now. And a lot of the trackmen refer to it as eye beam type rail. And we, we uh, encounter quite a bit of this balloon rail that we replace with eye rail when things like this are happening, as you can see here, where uh, rails are destroyed and they may be uh, they may be unable to be repaired. Now we find out quickly how we can destroy the rail. The rebels find out quickly how fast they can put it back together. So the same way that technology develops, the same way that destruction develops and, and repair, that, well, if we tear it off, we can remove the ties out of the way. That's one way to destroy the rail. That's your quickest way is just pull the, pull the spikes out that hold the rails to the wooden ties. But then the rebels can just quickly put the rails back together that way. So the next step is to remove the spikes entirely or take the rail and start to bend it. <laughs> or we start to corkscrew it as another way to do that. And I'll get more into that too. Uh, it comes out though that military leaders don't have the appreciation for the weapons that trains can become. And they see them more as uh, basically a, a uh, a bus service, if you will, or, or a streetcar kind of consideration. They don't really appreciate that the, the trains themselves can carry how, how, uh, how much volume they can carry, which I had alluded to earlier. So the, uh, the more you carry in the cars, the heavier they become, which means now you've got to have this heavier rail too. So I was trying to uh, work that back into where I had been on that. Hopefully that answers your question. So when we get into just how long should a, a railroad train be or what's the, uh, what would be like the standard size train that we could use, an average core in the army, or rather a three core army in the field, which is uh, core is the echelon of size, like most, my, like the army of the Tennessee that I had to invest Vicksburg, we had 80,000 men spread across three core and each core is commanded by one of my sub, uh, subordinate generals. So an average core, this is something Sherman had written to me about. You can calculate that the wagon train of the Army of the Tennessee, if you put it end to end, and that's with uh, a four or six horse team and a long wagon, if you stretched it end to end, nose to tail of the one team to the back of the wagon to the next and on, it's, it's nearly three and a half miles long. Um, now, a, uh, a box car that's going to pull all that kind of weight, for 10 wagons in that train, it's one box car. So right here in this in this image here, where the man is standing next to the open box car, one, two, three, four, five on this first track that you can see, and that's ten wagons for each. So that's that's the equivalent of fifty wagon loads that you can put into that right there. Uh, you could also consider that for how many men you can carry. Uh, most times, though, the soldiers will ride on the tops of the cars. They're not really uh, they're not riding for the the Pullman experience. They're not getting inside the coaches. So here is one standard army wagon. Now, 10 of those will fill up one box car. This is something I said that Sherman said to me. Now he also said, I'm never easy with the railroad, which takes a whole army to guard. He says, each foot of rail is essential to the, to the whole, whereas they can't stop a river like the Tennessee and each boat can make its game. So what he's saying there, every, every mile of track has to be guarded. And if he's marching 45 or 50,000 men, 
along uh, a, a certain mile of, uh, distance of track, every 10 miles or so, he's got to leave a number of men behind to protect those rails. Whereas on a river, every a river boat may carry the same equivalent load of a, of a, a 10 car train. And each river boat can go on its way and you can't really stop the river from flowing. So the boats will continue, but you can stop the track if you're able to do that. And he didn't want to keep relying on that as he's going through Georgia. My campaigns in Tennessee and Mississippi were at first focused on the rivers. Uh, if, you, if you follow our route, because uh, uh, just a few days ago was the anniversary of our investment of Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River, we had captured and destroyed Fort Henry on the Tennessee River in northern um, Tennessee in the middle of the state. And we're working down the Tennessee River. We, we come into Shiloh on the river. And our real, real objective there was Corinth, Mississippi, which is further south of that, which is a railhead. So in many uh, respects, the river campaigns turn into rail campaigns because of the uh, vicinity and the coordination between using river ports to go to railheads, which then the railheads will be able to move goods and material and soldiers inland away from the rivers. Uh, the, uh, the Vicksburg campaign in particular, mostly about getting across the Mississippi River and hemming in the city of Vicksburg against the river. But there are railroads involved. Uh, there's a railroad connecting Vicksburg to the east of it, 60 miles away at the uh, state capital of Jackson. Now, as I mentioned, Corinth, Mississippi is a railhead north of Vicksburg and south of Shiloh. It's a, it's a, uh, a connecting point for a north-south line and an east-west line. The uh, north-south line is the Mobile and Ohio, which collect, connects the state of Ohio to Mobile, Alabama, the port there. And then you have the Charleston and uh, Nashville line, which obviously runs east to west from Charleston on the, on the east coast and it, it kind of skews up into Tennessee to go over to Nashville. So this, this point where the tracks meet, it looks like almost like a cross, it's two tracks in both directions. So you have two going north, two going east to west. And uh, that, the railroad men refer to that as a diamond. And this, this depiction here is of uh, some of the heavy fighting that goes on de uh, deliberately right there at the diamond where the tracks meet. This is uh, part of the rail yard at Corinth. And here, here is, in fact, the diamond in Corinth itself, looking, uh, looking southeast at that vantage point. Now, I should tell you, in the autumn months of 62, when we first moved against Vicksburg, Nathan Bedford Forrest had destroyed my, uh, my supply line on the Mississippi and Tennessee Railroad, which was here. Again, boxcars along the way. So I had to move back to Memphis in order to get supplied and work on uh, getting towards Vicksburg. And uh, as I say, everybody gets really good at destroying railroad rail. You destroy that track and that prevents that transportation of goods. And like all other aspects of military tactics and strategy, a successful army commander will recognize when it's time to adapt to new circumstances and find solutions to them. It's funny, we had mentioned that earlier today about adapting a new technology. Now the Southern railroaders understand that they don't have the uh, industrial capacity though to keep up with uh, what we're doing. All right. Now, uh, following the capture of Vicksburg and the fall of, of uh, Chattanooga, I'm given overall command of the armies. But uh, before Chattanooga, in October of 63, after the Battle of Chickamauga in Georgia, General Thomas uh, had been uh, set back from Georgia so he runs back north into Chattanooga, Tennessee, but he allows himself to be hemmed in in that space. And uh, the problem for him, even though there's a railhead and the river's there, the Confederates that he's run away from have uh, buttoned him up. They've uh, controlled access to the river and they uh, control access to the railroads around him. Technology. So Thomas's army is trapped in the valley around the Tennessee River. And it is a major, major rail junction that's there. And as soon as I get everything to catch up, I can show you what's coming next. Yeah. So we use the rail yards uh, 
Um, and the river itself, once we uh, restore contact in Chattanooga to what I, st I say is referring to the, uh, the cracker line, which supplies them. Now, if every army commander invested as much time into the railroads as they need to, they would never have time to command their armies and go into battle. So uh, this leads to the development that I've spoken of already about this uh, U.S. Army railroad system. Now, granted, we do work with the civilian railroads quite a bit. There's a, there's a great amount of cooperation. The railroads are going to make money. In fact, the B&O works both sides. They transport things for the north and they transport things for the south. They take advantage of being in a neutral area such as Maryland would like to consider itself. So they, uh, they can do that. Uh, the U.S. Army Railroad, though, can't always rely on the Northern Railroads to come further south with them. So the U.S. Army Railroads develop their own system and, and get their own budget out of Congress. And they quickly find that they need somebody in charge who understands railroads, but also has an Army connection. I can't understand why things aren't working the way they should here. Okay, there we go. Maybe? No. Give me a second. Give me a second with this. You forgive me here. So what I'm getting to is we have to find somebody to run the railroads that has an army background. Now that person who has the background is going to be Herman Hopped, who is a West Point graduate but is also a railroad man. When he had graduated from West Point, he uh, went to work pretty much right away for the Pennsylvania Railroad. He left the army and uh, moved on. Now I have to get to sharing my screen. Here we go. Here we are, here's Herman Hopped. So you can see him. And uh, he had worked with the Pennsylvania Railroad a number of years after graduating from West Point, he had he had also been a uh, professor at the Pennsylvania College in Gettysburg. So he has a uh, pretty good knowledge of the topography in that area. Lincoln wanted a railroad man. He worked as a civilian in the U.S. Army rail system until it became apparent that Army commanders weren't going to take orders from a civilian. So at my suggestion, Lincoln promotes him and makes him a brigadier general in 1863 so that he could speak army language and be uh, accepted and understood. So he, is, he definitely helps the Union Army in Virginia. And one of the most brilliant things he was able to do was not only uh, create rules and uh, details about how to move and uh, work the railroads, because of that, he is instrumental in getting supplies to George Meade at Gettysburg and getting as many wounded out as possible on trains coming into Gettysburg. And I think it's important to remember his uh, contributions to that. What he had uh, stated was what he, what he calls his um, general principles of railroad supply and operation. And he writes up about detailed methods of construction and destruction, construction and destruction of railroad equipment. So here, these principles then are directing the military commander should never interfere with the efficient running of the railroad. Rolling stock, which is the freight cars, or even the coaches should be emptied and returned promptly to enable their reuse as transport whenever beneficial. So what he's saying is if you're taking, like at Gettysburg, if you're taking ammunition in, which came east, came from the east at Hanover, and you bring it in, well, even one boxcar of ammunition, that boxcar should not go out empty. If there are wounded or other things that need to go out, that all, they and that all need to be loaded into that car and taken back out again. There was too much uh, waylaying of, uh, rolling stock along the lines. And what you wind up doing that, even if it's a passing track, if there are two trains in opposite directions and they meet, you can't get around each other because they're using the passing track as a uh, siding. So that's not a good idea. Uh, in addition, large stockpiles, as he says, large stockpiles of railroad material should be gathered in certain places and rushed to areas that are damaged. So repairs can be done quickly and efficiently as completed. Now, what you're looking at here is a stock of what he calls prefabricated bridge parts. And these are struts that would be laid out 10, 15 miles away from each other along sections of the line that you anticipate might come under attack and uh, be destroyed. 
so we have little garrisons and this is uh, one of one of uh, hops innovations i'm sorry i can't get this larger for you the hopped truss bridge so that's one of the things he brings along in all his experience into the army command uh, we do have to set up garrisons and uh, guard these uh, things along the line. So troops are deployed, that which means that those are less troops that can be put into action. We are developing, as well as the Confederates, believe this or not, with the Confederates' uh, lack of funding, they're developing armored cars to put in front of the trains. So we're at a point now where I can talk a little bit more about uh, some of the... Uh, some of the innovations of the Confederate forces as far as what railroads have done. And the smart commander is going to see what the enemy does. And if he can take a page from that and learn from it, we're going to take advantage of that too. Uh, the Harper's Ferry link of several railroads at that point in Western Virginia is one of the most fought over areas, most contested areas all throughout the war as far as gaining control of railroads. I had already mentioned about Tom Jackson being out there. Uh, earlier on, though, in 1859, this area is witness to the first time that United States troops are deployed by train to, uh, to uh, a hostile environment. Now, if you know what happened in Harper's Ferry in 1859, you know about John Brown. And uh, it's another good point. Right, right before I get into this story, if there's another question, feel free to go ahead and ask that, please. No questions? Okay. All right. So what happens with John Brown? John Brown tries to uh, incite a slave rebellion. He arms uh, a number of slaves with pikes, and his men are armed with muskets. And uh, they hopefully, or what they hope to do is uh, stir up a rebellion of slaves around that area. It turns out that this thing is a wash, and John Brown and his men hole up in a firehouse in, uh, in Harper's Ferry. The only troops available in 1859, the closest troops available, wiring back to Washington from Harpers Ferry, the War Department says they have no troops in Washington they can send other than one company of U.S. Marines at their, at their barracks between 8th and I Streets in the Capitol. So what happens next, this company of Marines and their lieutenant, depicted here in the darker uniform, Israel Green, they get on a train at the station in Washington and they head west to Harpers Ferry. Now, what's interesting about this, it's not just the Marines that go because the, the Secretary of War and the Secretary of Navy agree that young Lieutenant Green is aptly named, that he's too young and inexperienced to handle this by himself. They would like a senior officer to go. The Colonel Commandant of the Marines doesn't want to go, so they're looking for another Army officer of equal rank. It turns out across the river from Washington and Arlington, Robert E. Lee, Colonel of the United States Army, is on furlough. He is summoned to Washington. He's told about the incident. Along with that, Lieutenant Jeb Stewart, United States Cavalry, is at the War Department looking for a new assignment and encounters Colonel Lee. The two of them head, then head to the station because Lee is asked to go. He agrees to. He's in a civilian suit, a long frock coat and a top hat like most men wear. Uh, Lieutenant Stewart is in his U.S. Cavalry uniform, and he's just as decked out with feathers and jangling spurs and everything else. He's always uh, a dandy. But these two officers get to the train depot, and the, the Marines have already gone down the line in a three-car train. There's one locomotive left for them, and it's facing the opposite direction. So they talk to the engine crew, and the engine crew agrees to chase the train load of Marines west to Harper's Ferry. So imagine that locomotive and tender running down the line backwards, two or three miles behind the train of Marines, or maybe even more. And you see in the cab, you see the engine crew, the two men working, and you see a man in a, in a suit, and you see a cavalry officer, and they're all looking down the track as they're heading out backwards. Uh, pretty interesting. Now, this young Marine, he may, he may be thought to be uh, too young to know what's going on, but as, as Marines go, and they may be overzealous to some, but they are mission oriented. And uh, the Marines have already rounded up John Brown or surrounded the firehouse when Lee and Stewart get there. And uh, the rest is history as far as the Marines storming and capturing John Brown and going on uh, with history there. But it's the first time, as I said, it's the first time to note in history that, that uh, US troops were moved from the Capitol shown here 
to an area uh, deploying in an actual situation. And this is different than just moving troops as trains were used in 1846 to get men uh, to the southern coast in Texas to load up on transports for the uh, trip into Mexico. Now I mentioned Petersburg and I mentioned the line there. You can see on this, uh, this image, Petersburg is at the heart of the image. If you look off to the rail lines that are going to about the two o'clock position on the clock, that is to my headquarters at City Point. Directly north of Petersburg on the map, off the map is the city of Richmond, way above. Notice there's some lines running to the south, one to about the four o'clock position, one to six, and then maybe to the seven or eight o'clock position out there to the west. The six o'clock position and the four o'clock position have been uh, broken up by our cavalry during the siege of Petersburg. The western line is still open because it runs further off the map to the west out to Danville to a line in Danville, Virginia that crosses into North Carolina and eventually will head down to the port of Wilmington where that four o'clock track would also take you. So you can see how important it is that we, uh, and we get in there and uh, cut off all those supplies too. So what we're looking at on the map, you can, any, any commander can see this. If Lee breaks off to the west, it's easy to assume that his first goal is gonna get out to that depot where hopefully he's gonna have supplies that have come in from Wilmington. But General Sheridan and I have had a, a healthy talk about the destruction that needs to be done. And uh, Sheridan assures me that he will be able to cut Lee off and uh, bring him to ground and he'll be able to get out ahead. And that's pretty much what happens. Cavalry under General Armstrong, George Armstrong Custer under the command of Sheridan does get ahead of Lee. They get to the depot at Danville and they capture food and other supplies that are on the trains there and they deny that then to Lee to use them. Significantly, this point here I've, I've spoken of, P, uh, City Point near the town of Hopewell is at the confluence of the Appomattox and James Rivers. There is a, an area that's about uh, 500 feet or so above the river on bluffs at the Appomattox Manor Plantation that looks across the confluence of the east flowing Appomattox and southern eastern flowing uh, James Rivers where we come together. Now we established this here with uh, a mile and a half's worth of wharves and uh, a rail yard where you can see the tall ships in the background. You see the mass of the ships and you see this rail yard being developed and the bluffs here looking down from where our cabins and our other headquarters areas are built. Those buildings off in a distance beyond the track, which are engine facilities. Those are some of the barracks and an army field hospital along with warehouses, if you look closely, that are out on the water on those, uh, on those areas. So this is uh, looking inland from that place where the rail depot is uh, giving you that, uh, that image. Now something else Hopped came up with, he calls it roll on, roll off. Here you see a barge with rail cars on it. This barge is floated across the James River or floated down the Potomac and then floated on the James River, hauled to City Point, lined up on the wharves where these warehouses are and you notice the cars are bisecting the barge. The track on, the, on which those cars sit are lined up with track along the wharf. Locomotives on the docks will come up, couple onto those cars and pull them off into the warehouses so that the cars can be either emptied or classified for further transport and made up into trains at City Point that are gonna be taken somewhere further down the line. That gives you a better idea. You can see here in the foreground how these rails are already waiting for that barge to line up on it and get those cars loaded. So Herman Hoft is credited with this roll on, roll off capability. Are there any questions at this point? There's another good idea. That USMRR, uh, that US military railroad. It was, it was- uh, That is correct, yes. That, yes, I'll go back to you and get a, a look at that maybe. Um, what's interesting now, the US Army Railroad, because the cars have that on there and they're numbered, for classification. The uh, railroad has named several of the locomotives. Uh, the, one for Herman Hopped. Uh, there's one name for me among other generals. And it's flattering. Uh, it's a little embarrassing for me because I really don't, uh, I'm really not looking for that kind of notoriety. But it is something that the railroad men have done that they refer to their locomotives by these different names. They refer to it by the general's name. Uh, other than just numbering them like most of the railroads do, they. Uh, the numbering system in railroads in America 
comes about during the course of the Civil War because they just have so many to keep track of that it's easier to number them rather than just give them all uh, flourishing names. So this is a map of the city point line that you can see as far as uh, way off on the right side, there's a little hook in the river where city point is and you see how the river flows out to that. If you go west along the line, you'll see how the track eventually works its way into Petersburg. Now at city point, I mentioned the rail yard. I mentioned the classification yard, the docks with the roll on roll off capability as well. Uh, we have a bakery at City Point. We're only eight miles from the front. During the siege of Petersburg, as we choke off Lee's army and, and begin to really starve him, much as we did at Vicksburg to the army there, uh, his men are starting to come through the lines because they're hungry. One of the most greatest contributing factors to that is the fact that as the trenches are so close together, the men can smell the food. And we're not talking about hardtack and uh, regular army fare. There's a bakery at City Point. The, the, the bread that's being baked at City Point is still hot and fresh and being loaded on the cars and brought out to the siege line. Now you can imagine you're in the trenches, you're down to eating shoe leather and whatever squ uh, squiggly animal might come running through the trenches and you smell fresh bread. What's that gonna do to your belly? That belt, that's gonna pull you out of the line and surrender or bring you across. So this bakery is at Fort Union really has uh, contributed in, in an incredible way to influencing many of the men to surrender from uh, City Point to this area beyond the trees and behind, beyond that sign is where the bakery would stand. Now water transport on the James River gives me easy access then to Fortress Monroe out on at Harper's at uh, rather Hampton Roads and up to Washington City and, and then uh, also then to transport goods and men back and forth across all the ports in the north. It also gives Lincoln an excellent means to be able to come down to see us. Uh, there are times Lincoln has come down just to get away from Washington and he comes down to City Point. The first time he comes, he wants to review the troops and I've given him uh, one of my horses to ride and I've given him my, my newest pony, Jeff Davis, who's very fast. Uh, but when Lincoln gets on that horse, he's too tall for it. So his feet start to drag on the ground a little bit. So uh, I'm on Cincinnati, which is my uh, favorite horse, my bay, who's 17 hands. And I put Lincoln on, on Cincinnati so he doesn't have to drag his feet. So th this makes Lincoln then come to think that Cincinnati is his horse <laughs> to use when he comes. Uh, it's on the, on the day that uh, we are departing for the front at the end of March after our, our conference on the River Queen. I have my three car train ready to go. Uh, my, my coach that I use as a, as a rolling headquarters cabin, there's a flat car in the middle. That's a corral car for my two horses I bring to the front. And there's a box car with supplies for the horses. Lincoln and I are talking. He notices that uh, Jeff Davis and Cincinnati are being loaded by my groomsmen onto the flat car. And he just kind of casually says, oh, I noticed you're taking Cincinnati away. And I said, well, yes, I'd like to take him along because I need to have a second horse. And he shrugs and looks away the other way and says, well, I was looking forward to riding Cincinnati a few more days while I was here once you're gone. So I had to get Cincinnati taken off the train. And he turns to me and he says, no, don't go doing that just for me. But there was no way I was going to deprive the president of uh, riding like that. Um, as, I, as you can tell, this is the season because Lincoln's birthday was just yesterday. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to share uh, such a story about Lincoln and his uh, humility and his humor as well. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Sherman if, you, if uh, we're okay with that. If there's a question, I, I'm seeing that we're close to the hour mark. So if there's something somebody wants to get to, I'm, I'm happy to entertain that here. Anything from anyone? We don't have any questions on Facebook at this time. Okay. Is there a comment? Is there something somebody is, is itching to add? Because I'd like to include you if you'd like to uh, participate. Anything there? Let me tell you about Sherman then. Uh, I told you how Sherman's been uncomfortable using railroads, but uh, during the Atlanta campaign and the march to the sea, uh, the sheer volume that trains can carry kind of brings him around a little bit. Uh, he wrote to me about this uh, from Atlanta. A single stem of railroad, that from Louisville to Atlanta, 473 miles long, 
supplied my army of 100,000 men and 35,000 animals for a period of 196 days. Now, on the average, a horse needs about three pounds of food a day, and a man needs about one pound of food a day. So you can imagine 100,000 men and 35,000 animals that need to be fed and uh, tended to for almost half the year. So he says to me, the amount of food and forage we needed would have taken 36,800 wagons, each pulled by six mules. This each day is a simple impossibility in that region of the country. And he means in the, uh, the lower Tennessee into Georgia uh, region. So we've discussed at length how vital to our success this is into mastering the logistics of that march. Uh, this is a great example, rather quickly, just to show you, uh, looking from the bluffs where my cabin is placed at City Point, down on the rail yard, you can see the locomotives here. Some of them have different names. This is uh, the Firefly in front, and I'm not quite sure which generals the two other locomotives behind it are named right there. Uh, the Army Railroad is using mostly wood powered. I had somebody ask me that once if we were using coal powered and their, their reasoning to ask that, they thought since the federal government has virtually unlimited funding and can write themselves a larger budget, would it be, uh, would it be prudent to use coal fired locomotives? In some aspects, it would be. And from the standpoint of coal burns hotter, which means you can use it in larger locomotives, which would pull more, uh, more volume in the goods or faster trains. But that's not something the Army's decided to go with. It's uh, looking at saving someone on the budget that will continue to use mostly wood burning uh, locomotives for the time being, because wood is a readily available source, as you can imagine, throughout the whole of the countryside. So Sherman and I have talked about this uh, moving an army and uh, the logistics of that. And I'd like you to consider something here. Uh, the Civil War is the first war where armies are moved by something other than the muscle power of animals, whether it's, whether it's humans or uh, beasts of burden. So this is, a, this is a, a large development that somebody needs to write a thesis on and use at West Point for future classes because uh, Napoleon is famous for having uh, having this attached to him that an army moves on its stomach, which means you've got to feed your men. Uh, so the large, like I said very early in our conversation today, the larger the army, the lar the greater the requirements to uh, support that army with food, whether it's animals or the men. And uh, the ability to move larger volumes of support for the army allows you to increase the size of your army. The beauty with these iron horses is that they don't have to be fed unless you're going to move them. Locomotives parked on a siding can sit idle with no fire going because you don't need them. But whether, where if you have horses, mules, and oxen, they have to eat every day whether you're moving them or not. So it is becoming something extremely important. Now, I did mention a little bit about repair track and destroying the track. Uh, Sherman had employed 1,500 men for that purpose for quite a while. Uh, who had asked earlier about locomotives and, and the US Army Railroad, if you look closely on the back of this locomotive, this is the Herman Hopp, the General Hopp locomotive here. So the troops themselves obviously become very adept at repairing the track and they become very adept at destroying the track. And particularly in uh, Sherman's march through Georgia, his men developed this technique where they tear the rails apart, they take the wooden cross ties and pile them up they take the, the torn off rails and pile them over the wood and light that afire, almost like a funeral pyre. And you get the rails literally red hot and men on both sides of the rails can pick it up, find a nearby tree or telegraph pole and go over there and wrap the rail around the tree. And uh, they develop this and they start calling these Sherman's bow ties for how they do that. Now the Southerners that might come in to repair that once his army is gone, the first thing they're going to do is heat up that rail again and maybe break it off so they can have shorter sections of rail that they can reconnect. It's not the best ride, it's bumpy, but it can get the track back together. So something then that uh, Sherman's men do in the ongoing uh, development of destruction, they not only get those rails red hot and wrap them, they can get them so hot and with the, the tools that they have, they can twist them like the way licorice is twisted, if you imagine that. There's not a Southern uh, industrial facility that's available that can untwist that rail. The best they'd be able to do is to heat it up enough and turn it into molten iron and re-pour it and cast it as a new rail. But they just don't have the facilities at that point in the fighting 
from Sherman's March in 64 until the end. Uh, the last Confederate ironworks in, in the Deep South is in Birmingham. And of course, Sherman's men get to that. He destroys their ability to do this in Atlanta. Uh, the the Tredegar ironworks in, in Richmond is one of the last places to go. But how are the rebels going to get that rail to v Virginia and get it back again if they don't have the rails in between? So you can see how it all plays together and uh, gives us quite an advantage in our industrial, industrial capacity and uh, the might of uh, the Northern uh, forces. Uh, this is the engine facility in Atlanta. Now Sherman did not burn Atlanta. And I'd like to get to that just to cover that here. Uh, like the uh, Mississippi capital of Jackson, when Sherman and I rode into Jackson, Mississippi, Joe Johnston had already lit the town of fire to deny it to us and skedaddle. When Sherman goes into Atlanta, he wrote to me about this, that General Hood treated it the same as Joe Johnston had the previous city in that uh, General Hood had lit Atlanta much on fire before Sherman could get in to deny him resources. Hood made a very big mistake by allowing those fires to rage out of control near the uh, engine house and the, and the roundhouse itself where this turntable is, was a yard full of cars with ammunition aboard them. So you can imagine what happens to gunpowder when you get near a fire. And a lot of gunpowder and a lot of cars created a huge explosion which tore this entire rail facility apart where it's nearly, nearly unusable. Now, through it all there, uh, the, obviously then the railroads have become a vital element in our success or demise of the two causes. And depending on your point of view for that, be that as it may, um, I've been inspired to consider what the railroads would do for restoring the country as I go along because I'm seeing how the railroads are being rebuilt behind us and I'm seeing how they allow us uh, to go on and ever the optimist about bringing the country back together as Lincoln has suggested about letting them up easy. I feel it's extremely important that uh, we reconnect the country and the railroads are going to be one of the strongest ways to do that uh, with the fighting coming to a close. Now, can you tell me, please, how much time we have? And if we don't have time, I, I have, I can cut here. And if we do have time, I can share an, another interesting story for you. Well, we we have had a few questions here. Okay. Um, Paul wants to know from Facebook, um, what is the best collection of Civil War railroad engines and cars to see? Wow. Well, maybe this is a good time to step out of character then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's... That's hard to say because most of the Civil War engines and cars that, you know, cars that predate 1865, most of them are gone. Uh, the most famous, arguably, is the Western and, and Atlantic locomotive, the General, and another one called the Texas, which were involved in the great locomotive chase with Andrews Raiders in 1862. Both those engines survived. The Texas was recently restored cosmetically to its post-war appearance with a different stack. Uh, the general remains uh, intact and uh, last operated at, at the Civil War Centennial, but it is and it is a locomotive that could be fired up. The B and O Museum keeps uh, the George Mason, which actually was used in uh, the Wild Wild West movie that was out in the '90s, and there's a few others. Uh, there are replica Civil War locomotives. There's two in Pennsylvania, one at New Freedom, which at a, at a place that used to be referred to as Steam into History under a new name. Uh, there's another short line close by there in Elizabethtown at the Star Barn that has another one of these replica 1860s locomotives. Both of them are built from the, from the ground up as oil burners, but they have the appearance of the wood burning locomotives of the Civil War period. In the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, right across the street from the Strasburg Railroad, the State Museum has uh, the, the, uh, a second class car from the Cumberland Railroad, which ran between Chambersburg and Harrisburg. Uh, that, that's the, the photo where I'm on the step talking to Lincoln. Uh, that car is in the museum. It was, a, it was actually a smoking car <laughs> where the men were allowed to smoke on this outer deck on the one side of it. It had been converted from a baggage car. Uh, that's the only true Civil War period piece that's in the State Museum in Pennsylvania. Now, you can go uh, into other states, like I said, talked about in the South. I'm sure at Roanoke, there's got to be something. and I've not been to that museum yet. Uh, if you go to the museum it's in Sacramento, in California, the Rail Museum, the State Museum for California has a glorious collection. Uh, 
the locomotives that look Civil War period, they're actually post-Civil War. And uh, the locomotives that were at Promontory, Utah, whether there's replicas of those, which there are, or the originals, they're out in the Western states too. So it, that would be an interesting study just to find the actual Civil War collections that are out there and find out which is the largest and most intact. Uh, Bob on Facebook would like to know, uh, a few images ago, you showed a photo of a roundhouse. He wanted to know uh, where exactly that roundhouse was. Which roundhouse? Well, I'll go back. Probably, I think, like that one. This, uh, this depiction, I'm pretty sure that was the roundhouse that was at City Point. It's very similar to the roundhouse that's now the B&O Museum, and, and it could be because they were really similar in their construction. Uh, that round, the roundhouse of the B&O Museum, obviously it's intact, it's in Baltimore, and you can go there. Uh, it was rebuilt. There's a, there was a similar uh, roundhouse like this in Harper's Ferry that was destroyed during the war. It wasn't rebuilt until 1866, so I didn't want to include that. I had found the image, but the fact that it was built after the war, if there was anybody that knows the history, they would have called me out and said, nah, that's not a Civil War one. So I was trying to remain faithful to the Civil War uh, structures and, and uh, equipment. Well, Ken, Steve, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, General. Um, General, what is the uh, the preciousness actually of the railroad, uh, be it the uh, boxcars or the engine, is actually the engineers involved. Did you have any trouble maintaining uh, employment, if you will, of the engineers and those people that could run the railroads as you did the men that work that- uh, Personally, Personally, myself, that that's not something I had to deal with on on a on a level on that level itself. That's why you have uh, General Hopped in place where he is because that's that's his department to manage. That would be almost the equivalent of, of asking me about every section of guns and the officer in charge of four four cannon mm -hmm. and a battery. Would I have problems uh, giving them orders? That's something that I would delegate to someone else along the way. I have never had to encounter problems with the, with the crews that I've worked with personally. Uh, in fact, I have a standardized locomotive crew and tr cars that I use in Virginia that are available for me all the time. So I don't, I, not that I have my own personal, uh, my own personal train, but I have, I have access to a train that I can rely on myself. I'm sure there are instances, the same as it is amongst the Teamsters driving the, the, the uh, ox wagons that you'll encounter crews that don't want to cooperate for whatever reason. They may not be getting paid or they may feel that they don't want to go into a, a threatening environment. So I'm sure that's happened. Uh, Steve has asked, did, did either army use railroad mounted guns during the war as was done in World War I and World War II? There are some of that. I, I had alluded to that earlier about this armored rail car. It looked like a box car and had cannons sticking out. Several cars like that are built uh, experimentally where you could put ports in them for muskets to come out, but that does limit your range that you can move the musket around inside. During the siege of Petersburg on this Hopewell line, we have mortars, and one we called the dictator. It threw these gigantic shells, if you can imagine these 500 pound balls off of these cauldron looking mortars that are mounted on flat cars and they're pushed ahead of the locomotive. Sometimes two locomotives have to push that heavy car because of the ammunition that's involved too. And they're brought up as close to the front as possible. And uh, they, they used as siege guns to just lob these massive shells over our men into the lines at Petersburg. So we do, we do have that used on occasion, but there's nothing, nothing of a, of a permanent sort of an artillery piece that's mounted on a rail car other than those, uh, those the dictator and other mortars like that. And William would like to know if uh, Gatling guns were ever mounted on rail cars. Not at this point. Uh, you know, uh, the Army Ordnance Department and I get into this quite a bit about the type of weapons that we need to develop more of. Uh, the Gatling gun is not employed as much because the Ordnance Department, like uh, so weapons like like the Henry rifle and other repeaters uh, the, and the coffee grinder gun, which is similar to the Gatling gun, they are they are wary that the men will waste ammunition. So they kind of uh, discourage a larger employment of those. Most of the soldiers that are carrying a Henry rifle are doing so because of private funding. Uh, the ammunition is more expensive and the government is not willing to invest in it as much, even though these inventors come to Lincoln 
And every time they propose a new weapon and he gets to uh, use it and fire it to experiment, they give him a copy of it in hopes of influencing things. Uh, but the army is not employing Gatling guns on trains in the war. Anything else? We did have one have question. question that uh, someone wanted to know if you are left-handed. You seem to be moving the cigar around uh, hand to hand. Uh, I write right-handed. <laughs> I have my coffee on this side. I have the cigar on this side. So I do change it from time to time. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I was going to say, I know you mentioned that there were um, uh, the attempts at uh, armoring boxcars and armored trains and other, I assume, military style, you know, equipment for more security type things. Was there ever an encounter between either an armored train with a force or a, a military type train like that uh, and some other infantry force uh, a, a battle that's, that took place in which one of those a type of train like that was involved or even a battle between two armored, two trains of that style, one on each side? No, no train battles. Um... What you brought to mind was during our march from the, uh, Jackson, Mississippi to Vicksburg. Remember I said it, it was a 60 mile distance from Jackson heading west down the rail line into Vicksburg. There was a point around, uh, I believe it's Edwards Station, uh, just on the west side of Clinton, Mississippi, along the track. Our men are moving along the track and there's a train coming out from Vicksburg. And it's, it's uh, if you're looking on a map of that area, you have, uh, and I'll do this in reverse for your sake. In my cigar hand is Vicksburg. So heading east from there to this town of uh, Edward Station, in between that is a place called Champion Hill where there was a battle. So this train is leaving from Vicksburg because it didn't know how close our army was coming into it. And the uh, train got within sight of blue coats coming down the track. So the engine man slams the locomotive into reverse. Like you hear, they heard squealing brakes and they're seeing the rods going the other way. So they slammed it from, from whatever speed they were going forward right into reverse and tried to hightail it back. These men had artillery that they were able to lodge a shell, maybe a, a Napoleon or some other sort of field gun. They were able to puncture the boiler on that locomotive. They, they, were, they got a good enough shot where it caused the locomotive to lose steam. And it, it just kind of like a ship goes dead in the water. This locomotive just kind of, and its train just kind of slowed to a stop. And uh, the engine crew fled because they were fearful that the locomotive was going to blow up at that point because of uh, lack of control of the fire and the water going on inside it. So that's the only encounter during the Vicksburg campaign of troops deliberately with a train. There are other encounters where uh, cavalry raids will attack a train. Uh, there, are, uh, there are reports of locomotives receiving cannonballs in their stacks from fixed artillery if they were in a, set up in an ambush along the track. Uh, but there was never any deliberate... Uh, deployment of troops like a train wouldn't go in and the men jump off and set up perimeter around the train itself trains were used though by both sides as a way to kind of uh, fool the enemy of the size of the force that's arriving the, the rebels did it at corinth and we did it a number of times also our troops are outside of corinth mississippi uh getting ready to pounce on this railhead with three different armies so the confederate commander knows he's outnumbered i believe it was van dorn he orders one of the train crews, not even with a train behind it, but just the locomotive. He wants them to get out of town on the track and come back in, like maybe maybe get five miles outside of town, sit for five minutes, and come back in. And as you come into the yard, blow your whistle, sound your bell, and the men here will cheer. And they do this a number of times, and it gives the troops, our troops there, the impression that more rebel soldiers are arriving. So what the, and they do this at night. So what they also start doing every time a new train a, a new train arrives, they'll have men are, that are out and about that start setting campfires. So it appears that new new units are coming and popping campfires around the, all these other arriving trains, and we we catch on to that. And uh, our men, our generals, use that same sort of tactic. So the trains uh, kind of work as a psychological weapon in that regard. If they can lead us to believe they're getting more men, or we do the same sort of thing to them. Uh, Jerry would like to know, uh, have you always been interested in trains or did this interest come about from your interest in the Civil War and General Grant? Oh, this is Ken now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have always been a train nut. I was raised by a train nut. 
and my grandfather is a train well it was a train nut also my father grew up in Catasauqua watching uh an 060 shifter every day after school in the local yard on the Lehigh New England Railroad uh, my grandfather ran uh, some of the switch engines at the Bethlehem Steel and my grandfather when he retired from that opened a hobby shop on the north side of Bethlehem called Max or he started working there but he ran that hobby shop for a good number of years and uh, in the late 60s and 70s he became a pioneer in N-gauge modeling he saw that as a growing uh, venue you have you have your various size toy trains you have O gauge and S gauge and HO and then N is a lot smaller um, I grew up with all of that. I grew up going to Strasburg three times a year as a kid. In fact, I work part-time at, at Strasburg Railroad now as a brakeman. So in, in a lot of ways, I'm living that dream from being a kid where I work as a brakeman on steam-powered trains. And that's given me a really healthy respect for a lot of this. I've always studied them. Um, I became a fan of Grant at age eight. And you know, putting the two together for the types of trains that I like, like, like the one pictured here, and suitable into Grant's era, like the two things kind of uh, coupled and became one train together. So uh, it's always been a bit of a labor of love. It's always been a fascination and a hobby. I model N-Gage myself now. Uh, my grandfather willed me all his N-Gage because he said, in his own words, he said, Kenny's the only one with any sense because he knows what to model. And I modeled N because when I was in the Marine Corps, I lived in the barracks and as a staff sergeant, I had a two room suite. So one of the rooms I actually could set up a little table and if I used any any larger scale you know models it, well, I wouldn't have had much space at all so it was kind of out of necessity but at the same time I was really starting to enjoy it uh, in fact tomorrow I plan on getting back into my basement I'm working on my table to expand it <laughs> so this this is a uh, today's talk in particular is a great marriage between the two things that I really really enjoy studying you know trains and uh, General Graham and Jerry also asked, uh, had Grant studied the railroad prior to the war? Prior to the war, uh, that's I found that fascinating. When he goes to West Point, you know, he says that about imagine going more than 17 miles an hour. He really enjoyed that. But at the same time, he writes that he was praying for an accident, that the train would jump the track and he'd be injured, but not debilitating for life, just enough where he wouldn't have to go to West Point because <laughs> he didn't want to go. <laughs> But he does appreciate what trains can do. He's a speed demon. He loves horses. Uh, he's been breaking horses since he was eight. And as a teenager, some of the people who had race horse race tracks near his his home, the jockeys would bring their horses to him when he could, uh, and, and they expected him to take them out. The horses get uh, it's a combination of being constipated, and uh, they get uh, they get they get bound up somehow where. You have to take the horse out and they call it lathering the horse where they just take the horse on a hard run for a good three or four miles and get it lathered up where it sweats and it breaks loose whatever is you know hurting the horse and the jockeys feel that they don't want to do this so they hire grant as a teenager to do it so he's hopping on these fat you know imagine like in modern day uh a race car driver comes in and says hey take my car out and, and you know blow the carbon and you're this kid going oh cool a hot rod and you take this thing out and you run it so He's fascinated with speed. He's fascinated with how the horses go. Early in the Army career, after Mexico, he's in Detroit, and he gets in trouble for it in some respect, but he takes a, a two-horse wagon team out, and he runs it to see how fast he can get it going. Then he lashes a second two-horse wagon team behind the, the first one and rigs the line so he can sit on the back team like double-headed you know, horse, horse wagon teams. And he gets that going. Then after he gets it going, he, he starts to say, well, how fast can I get it going? So you put him on a train and he's already, you know, it's called an iron horse. So he's already fascinated with that. And he does have an appreciation for that. Uh, during the war, president of the B&O Railroad, Mr. Garrett, lets Grant use his private car the night that uh, Lincoln is shot to go home to New Jersey because it was announced that the Grants wouldn't go with the Lincolns, right? So uh, they say, we're, we're going home to New Jersey. So Mr. Garrett says, General Grant, take my private car as far as the line will go. So the B&O goes up to Philadelphia. And from Philadelphia, he has to get on a, a train that goes across the, well, it's a barge that goes across the Delaware River to Camden. Then it's the Camden and Amboy Railroad to his home in Burlington. So he rides on President Garrett's car. Uh, we say at the Strasburg Railroad, we, our, our line comes out to the Pennsylvania Main Line at uh, Lemon Place Junction. And in our narration, we say there how, and it's true, I found out from locals, 
Lincoln did come there in 1861 to the small town of Gap, like a mile down the line. So uh, Lincoln's inaugural trip from Springfield went uh, east from Illinois, right around to Pittsburgh, and went north up to Buffalo, and went across New York State, and then came back down into Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, or rather, no, from New York through New Jersey to Philadelphia. Then it came from Philadelphia to Lancaster to the North Central Railroad, which is where the steam into history line is now. And the North Central Railroad runs from around New Freedom, Pennsylvania, down to Baltimore. So Lincoln came through where the Strasburg line meets the Amtrak now. And it was the Pennsylvania Railroad at that time. And uh, we're allowed to embellish the narration a little bit. So what I have found out is that every president since Lincoln has actually ridden through that part of Pennsylvania on the train. If they've traveled through Pennsylvania on train, they've come through there, including President Grant uh, along the way. So that's always fun on President's Day to point that sort of thing out, too. Uh, he wouldn't have traveled on that on his way to West Point because I don't think the line between uh, Harrisburg and Philadelphia was was quite com uh, complete yet because you had the Columbia and Philadelphia Railroad from Columbia to Philadelphia along that line. And the Pensy bought it in 1857. Now, Grant went to West Point in 1839. So that's a few years before that. But as as a general, he had traveled through as president, for sure, he had also traveled through there. Definitely over Horseshoe Curve during Andrew Johnson's swing around the circle after the war was over. Probably more information than you wanted. One other thing about Grant is he spent the Mexican-American War most of that time as a supply guy. So right. he was very aware of just how much food and how much fodder an army on the move could go through. Outstanding. Yes. Great that you picked up because uh, that's kind of like what I was cluing on is that, yeah, he's a master of logistics by the time the war ends. I spoke yesterday for the uh, Central Catholic High School in Pittsburgh, and I spoke just about Grant's military career. And what I pointed out was everything in his military career, but everything from age 17 until being becoming president, he gets things thrust on him that he doesn't want. He didn't want to go to West Point. So he adapts to that. He wants to go into cavalry. He's denied that and made an infantry officer. He wants to go back to West Point to teach math. He's made a, a, a supply officer in Mexico because of his math skills. So all these different uh, diversions from the route he wants are things that are really lining up to train him, no pun intended, but they're, they're giving him uh, background and the things that are going to make him the successful general he is because everything about leading the armies in 1863 and on is really about logistics. So thank you for... Uh, for noticing that. And it is something I've discovered in my army logistics studies. I have a really good friend who was an army logistician for 33 years that does a lot of civil war study. He dumps the most incredible volume of logistical information into my head. And it takes me almost weeks to really process it. But what's, what's really good about that is it allows me or kind of directs me to think about it like Grant would, because Grant is this logistics guy. And, uh, He's, he's an overall strategist. You know, like I said about delegating to these engine crews, it's the same thing. He delegates to Army and Corps commanders so he can have his other strategic vision. And the first thing he looks at is I've got to give these men ammunition, I've got to feed them, and I have to get them to, to and from. So those are always his first concerns when he begins his planning. <laughs> any other uh, any other questions here before we wrap up? Now, what I have to work out if I if I do this program live, I've got 50, 50 slides I share with you. I'm going to have to boil it down to a, a lower number that actually I can produce large images and have them up on easels and be able to use those to refer to. Uh, I do have a piece of balloon rail, and I'm sorry I didn't bring that up. Uh, I have a, a small, it's like a four foot sec, a four inch section of balloon shaped Civil War era rail that I have. And uh, that's always a fun piece to show. At least you can get the look of it and uh, actually hold it in your hand if you want, if you care to. All right, well, you've got uh, you have lots of compliments here on well, Facebook and, uh, and here on Zoom. Everyone enjoyed the talk. Thank you. And, and we'll be sure to have you back to Pittsburgh here when we can all Get together oh, I again. love it. I hope so. I love coming out there. <laughs> I, lo I love the GAR room. I talk about it to people all the time. So it'd be really great to uh, come back out for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, General. Thank you. Um,
we'll look forward to having everyone back here one month from today, March 13th, for Meg Growling uh, from Emerging Civil War to talk about antebellum militias. Sounds like a thank good you. Time. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. All right.